We don't normally venture back far beyond the 486 on this channel, so here's something older in the form of a couple of 286 machines. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and today we're going to compare a couple of 286 machines. Basically, I have that old one and I built a faster one now. I wanted to see just how much it improved with time, you know, how much faster did the 286 get. There's definitely faster ones than what I've got here, at least well, as far as clocks go. But, you know, see a, a bit of maturity happening to the platform. Uh, main reason I'm doing this really now is because the old one is is not doing so well. Hard drives dying and they're very expensive and yeah, uh, Ed Neil tried to help out with that but unfortunately doesn't play ball with, yeah. So I don't know if I'm going to fix it because it, you know, it's, it's more than the machine's worth. <laughs> I'm probably just not going to bother. I've had my fun with it. I've got my money's worth out of the thing. It didn't cost as much to build as it will to repair. So anyway, let's, let's get on with this. In the 1980s, the IBM compatible PC wasn't really very good yet. It was bulky and slow with limited use cases, not to mention it was horribly expensive. For the most part, it was limited to running business-oriented software, which in all fairness is what it was meant for, and it was rarely seen in the household as a result, where 8-bit and later 16-bit micros would dominate for quite some time. Introduced in 1982, only one year after the first IBM PC, the 286 didn't exactly see rapid adoption, but it was a substantial improvement. We can cover that as we go along though. This is my old 286, it's called Tonya, for no particular reason. It's a heavy thing and it hasn't aged very well. We have a large Maxter hard drive sticking out of the front, which is failing rapidly, a 360k floppy drive that doesn't work, and I'm not really going to replace it, and a more modern one here that isn't very useful, and may not work. The turbo display was never properly configured, and it still shows 16 and 8 megahertz, which is wrong, well, I suppose a D-Tabo was for compatibility with machines that would have had 8-bit ISA, and the... Yeah, uh, it, that's what it symbolises. I, I totally meant to do that. I, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but I'm, that's my excuse, and I'm not changing my tune. I, I totally did it on purpose. At the rear, it becomes obvious that this system uses the AT form factor, where it probably still wasn't so uncommon to find machines using their own manufacturer-specific nonsense that I just don't have time for. It gets a little more interesting if we pull the cover off, of course. The motherboard is fairly typical of its time. Lots of components, but almost nothing built in. It does have a chipset, made by Chips and Technologies, spread across multiple ICs, four of them. You'll notice these are socketed, because at this time it was thought as more economical to repair a motherboard than replace it if something like that failed. You'd just order a new chip and replace the one that had died. The same is true of the RAM, it's spread across 36 individual chips. This is two banks of 18 chips, essentially 16 bits and final two acting as parity. This motherboard tops out at one megabyte, but this was almost never installed at the time, for some good reasons. 640k was really thought of as the sane upper limit here, and that was if you even had that much. The 286 CPU itself supports far more due to a 24-bit address bus and the brand new memory management unit. It tops out at around 16 megabytes. It's really unheard of to have that installed, although there are a handful of late motherboards that claim to support it in one way or another. RAM in dip sockets, like this, seems to be referred to as either dip DRAM, which makes sense, or in some literature, zip RAM, which makes no sense and is kind of dumb, because to me, zip means this weird package that you don't really see anymore, and I seem to be quite popular in Japanese electronics for some reason. I kind of liked it, it was like a dip chip cocking its leg or something. Anyway, at one megabyte, the limit for this board, one bank is used as conventional memory, and the latter is used as XMS. You can't alter this arrangement, that's all you're going to get either way, so conventional memory would now be limited to 512k, and that's where we run into our first issue with this platform. Most applications were still written to work on an 8088, 
a CPU that doesn't have things like protected mode or fancy memory management capabilities on board. These applications eat conventional memory exclusively, i.e. the fast 640k, as will drivers you might have to run for a mouse, something the computer might have never seen attached back then, a printer or a network operating system just for example, taking a hit in the capacity of conventional memory to gain extended memory was a pretty dumb idea in all but a few niche applications, as, well, obviously these applications are now going to have less memory to run in, and they can't use XMS or EMS. Even in the early 1990s, many programs still ran entirely in the fast 640k of RAM, so you can see why you'd go with the 640k option instead. Rambling aside, these chips seem to be NMOS, and they get quite hot. I don't miss RAM coming in this arrangement, I'm glad that it became cost effective to simply use a module and replace that whole module if a chip on it died, but at the time this would be uneconomical as memory was very very costly and well you'd want to just replace whichever chip had broke. The 286 CPU itself is a PLCC chip here, it's made on an NMOS process and its transistors are well over a micrometer in size, I think about one and a half if not larger, it depends when it was made. Probably bigger on this one because it's quite old. However, it does contain 134,000 of these transistors, whereas the more common 8088 of the time had only 29,000, which, yeah, there's been a substantial leap here. This particular chip is rated for 8 MHz, but this board is set up to run 6 MHz. In fact, it can only run 6 MHz unless you want to desolder the crystal. Some other boards did have sockets for these crystal oscillators, but it really wasn't uncommon for the board to just come for one speed, and that speed alone with no adjustment whatsoever available. You bought it at 6 MHz, you're getting 6 MHz, that's your lot, and obviously whatever it detarbos to, presumably half. There were slower variations of the 286 around, for that matter. Apparently they went down to 4 MHz, but I've never seen one of those in person, and I can't imagine they're particularly common. They probably weren't made for very long. Moving on, there is an FPU installed, obviously it's a 287. It runs at the same frequency as the CPU here. Some other boards will divide the CPU clock, or offer a second clock entirely just to run this, it depends. Most motherboard settings are handled by these four dip switches, basically memory size and video card type and well that's your lot. I don't even know what the fast switch does, nothing tangible happens when I flip it so it probably does nothing. The BIOS is partitioned into two EPROMs, this is to say it's a 16-bit ROM split onto two 8-bit chips. If you ever opened a BIOS ROM in a hex editor and noticed the doubled up copyright string at the top where each letter is repeated, I think this might be why, as well, reading only one of the chips would still give you a copyright string that you could read and see who made the bias and possibly what it was for. Of course, the system just reads it as a single 16-bit wide ROM. Odd bytes are stored in one of them, even bytes in the other. It used to be common to do things this way, you don't really see it so much now. There's a keyboard controller on this board, which is fairly normal, but this one looks old school because it has that gold cap and... Yeah, obviously they went plastic pretty quickly. It works the same way, it's not really worth, like, worrying about. Naturally, it does run hotter than the later ones. Still, aside from that and the fan header, that's about the only peripherals you've got built in. But there really isn't much that the board can do on its own. Everything else is going to need external cards. So there's a video card from Everex, the EV673. It's an early VGA card from 1987. These early VGA cards are slow and limited in capabilities, which is to say they really are VGA only aside from whatever backwards compatibility they might have offered, and that backwards compatibility might not be very good. So the resolutions and colour depth available on these earlier cards are rather low. There's no acceleration, obviously no visa support, no nothing. It has a 256 kilobyte frame buffer, it outputs VGA, that's it. Seeing the mess of hot running components sure makes you appreciate those single chip cards from the 486 era onwards, doesn't it? We can force this card to output TTL video signals for older monitors and play with a few other settings all from the 8W dip switch at the back. Admittedly, I do rather like this card for its sheer bulk. It does still use an 8-bit ISA interface though. 
Of which the same is true for this interface card, offering serial, parallel and a game port. Hey, we didn't have sound cards with game ports on them yet, so this was your only way of plugging in a controller for the few games worth even bothering with. And let's be honest, games looked and played much better on other systems for a very long time. When this was around in the mid-80s, it's pretty much a given that your master system was going to kick the shit out of your PC as far as gaming was concerned. This thing was a business machine, it wasn't really supposed to do that. Hey, check that out, 1488. <laughs> Yeah, this card uh, has its political alignment in order. We have of course seen this adlib clone before. The odds of the system coming with anything like this out of the box were pretty much nil, especially as the adlib didn't exist yet. Again, this was a business machine in the mid-80s. Some audio devices did exist already, but they weren't really in common use. A lot of them were fairly application specific, like speech synthesizers that would only work with one or two programs, and Obviously, you're not really going to install those in everything unless you really need them for this one specific use that probably nobody even remembers now. This system actually has a 3Comp F-Link 2TP card in it as well, which is set up under DOS. It works fine, but it's a little bit ugly at doing things this way. It's not usually much faster than a parallel Laplink cable, and as you just map drives, it behaves quite similarly. At least with both of these options you do keep full speed, as accessing floppy drives seems to de-turbo the CPU or something. Either that or it's just the interrupt's been hammered, as it does seem to really slow things down. And now the hard drive and floppy controller. This one is actually 16-bit, or kind of, which was a fancy new feature of the 286. The 8088 only offered an 8-bit data bus, and so it only allowed for 8-bit ISA. Yeah, the ISA bus used to be 8-bit. Granted, the 8086 from which that CPU was derived had a 16-bit bus, but this wasn't anywhere near as common as the cheaper 8088 for use in PCs. There are some serious limits at play here, though, where some of these old 286 boards are almost certainly built on top of the older 8088 boards, and while 16-bit expansion cards will work most of the time, there are some obstacles, there are some caveats to that which we'll get to, well, now. For one thing, cards with a bias on them are largely limited to that bias acting as it would in an 8-bit slot. Some older cards do, but this causes issues with things like later video cards. If you try to install a 90s VGA card in this system, it won't work, and the machine will just beep angrily, thinking the video card is missing or broken. Of course, VGA didn't exist yet in this machine's time, so it really expects monochrome or at best CGA or EGA, which have a bit of a different way of doing things to VGA as far as biases are concerned. You can't really use IDE in here either, or at least there's no easy way to do it. The system BIOS is still set up to use MFM hard drives, and it expects those controllers to mask the original interrupts, uh, which there were only eight. This motherboard seems to expect the hard drive to be on IRQ5, where IDE generally sits on IRQ14 invariably. As such, you would need a BIOS on the IDE card itself to get around these limits, and also to do sector translation, as the BIOS predates being able to input your own custom hard drive parameters. You get the 46 presets and that's it. To make matters worse, while you can use 3.5 inch floppy disk drives, the support for them wasn't really good, as this format wasn't really around yet. Consider the DX72FD was lauded for using 720k discs, and this was somewhere around 1986 or 1987. It was a big deal. Shit synthesizer, and that was a useless feature, but, well, it was there, and it was a thing. boot from three and a half inch discs on this machine either. This motherboard can only boot from either the hard drive or from 360k floppies. Larger diskettes don't work. Of course you can read and write them in the operating system, but you just can't boot from them. Also you can't boot anything beyond DOS 5 for some reason. I don't know if the boot sector changed or there's instructions the CPU doesn't like, but I'm hesitant to say the latter because I can boot DOS 6 on newer 286s, so... 
Uh, who knows? Even DOS 5 is a bit new for this thing, really, but it, it got rid of some compatibility issues that DOS 3 had. Of course, as I said, such problems do tend to go away on later 286 boards. You'll have a much easier time of it on a board from 1990 than you will from, like, 85, 86. Everything about this board reeks of a comparatively early attempt at making a cheap clone of something that wasn't particularly cheap, so it is a little bit messy and precarious this way, but I respect it, because we all know clones are the best. Kind of. It's a subject that's come up a few times in, like, recent history, where I like to bash on OEM machines, and I always will bash on them, but... If, say, you owned an IBM 5170, which I'm fairly certain this older 286 board was trying to copy, then your 5170 is going to behave the same way as your friend's 5170. You've got, like, nigh on 40 years of documentation to refer to as to how it's going to behave in any given configuration. On the other end, this unbranded board probably doesn't behave the same way as my friend's different unbranded board in the exact same configuration, and there's no documentation, so you're just kind of stuck in the dark to try and figure things out yourself. I mean, it's kind of fun, but it's kind of annoying, and I can see the argument for OEM systems. I'd never use one myself, though I prefer to do it my way, even when it's the hard way, and so I'm going to just keep doing it this way. It's personal preference, I guess, but hey, you know, to each their own. So that was the older 286. Now meet the newer one. It's called Lisa. Unfortunately, I've had to hurry with this video, so you might see things in varying states of completion. Nonetheless, the curse reeks of the 80s, which is funny because there are certain things about it that lead me to think it was made in 1992, but it was probably just an old design they hadn't got rid of yet. I'm not sure what I'm going to put in the external 5-inch bay because I'm not forking out for a floppy drive to live there, don't really have use for a tape drive, and can't imagine CDs being all that useful on a 286, but yeah, maybe we will do that just for the sheer pointlessness of it. At the back, it's a bit of a strange thing. It's a low-profile AT chassis, but it has this empty slot running along the bottom. I'll just cut and tap a strip of metal for this at some point, or just use plastic, whatever, it's not that urgent, we'll get there. The keyboard hole is a little bit smaller than usual, so PS2 adapters won't fit, as well as a handful of keyboards, which is a little bit annoying, but well, you get what you're given, and we'll just have to work around it. Under the lid, you might think this case looks familiar. It's very similar to the case my Chips and Technologies 386 lives in. Almost as if that one is a later version of this one, and it may well be. We'll do things in a different order for this system because of the way it's put together, so firstly, there's an ISA riser in the middle of the chassis. As ISA is parallel, it opens up the doors to doing things like this with it, and many systems used risers and relied heavily on this characteristic. Things get a little bit more complicated when you start running into PCI and VLB risers, but it's not like you'll be seeing those on a 286, or I can't imagine so anyway. This nick may or may not work, I can't tell and haven't been able to test it properly just yet. It wasn't working in the Toshiba it came out of, so who knows. It looks old enough to fit the system, and it's not like you'd typically get one with the machine anyway. I mean, obviously it wasn't entirely common to have that sort of thing yet, and the manufacturer including it would just be weird, because it's not like everybody was just using Ethernet on Cat5e cables back then. There were still a lot of different standards that weren't compatible, and you, your building was obviously going to be different to everybody else's, there was a good chance of that, so yeah, just let someone else deal with that problem. Now, isn't this thing amazing? This is the Trident 8800 CS. It's a low-cost VGA card produced only a year after that Everex card. God damn, talk about component shrinkage. I'm not kidding, that's absolutely mental. Look at them both next to each other. This is a 16-bit card, but the bias is implemented such that this one would work in the older 286. I think it'll work in 8-bit slots even, with the extended bit for 16-bit ISA just hanging off the, the end in the air, kind of clumsily. The card has twice as much memory as the Everex 2 at 512k. It still has this vestigial 9-pin connector, but in this one I think it only acts as TTL, where the Everex can output analog through here. To make things more confusing, some early VGA implementations were 9-pin. It never was common, but it did exist. The hard drive controller is much smaller too. 
and doesn't have a bias anymore. Now the system deals with that sort of thing exclusively. It can even boot IDE, this machine, without any additional bias, and it does accept custom drive parameters. There is a generic MIO card in here too, with its IDE disabled. We're just using that for its other interfaces. I'm going to change this whole setup with the hard drive and MIO card eventually. It's not ideal like this, but I have plans for what's in here. This is just keeping them safe. I suppose what we didn't really talk about in the script, this uh, hard drive interface, it really is a lot like the floppy interface, like pretty much is on that cable. And then data transfers are through that one, but yeah, it's it's not the same interface, but it's not immensely dissimilar. It's MFM, or I think this one can do ESDI, but yeah, uh, it's uh, probably not worth worrying about. If you can get away with running IDE in your machine, just run IDE. For the love of God, just run IDE. It'd save yourself so much hassle. Lastly, there's a sound card. It's a MediaVision Thunderboard, and it's a little bit dodgy. This was professionally refurbished, and I say that in quotation marks. Basically, some moron bastardized it with electrolytic capacitors, and they're the wrong value and wrong type. It had the wrong jack installed at the back, so it was just weird. They put the wrong volume knob on. It didn't work at all, and I've done the best I can. I'm still not sure my capacitor values are correct, and I can never put the original volume slider thing back on because they've gouged holes in the back plate, so we'll, we'll just have to make the best of it. It's working now. It's a Sound Blaster compatible card, and... Yeah, it, it's a bit muddy sounding, which I think is probably something isn't right, but it's, it's pretty neat to see one, at least. This chassis has no internal 3.5 bays. All you've got, as far as that goes, is that temporary floppy drive there that came out of a ditch and does work. Hard drives are supposed to go in the 5-inch bay there. This drive was donated by Ed Neal, and it was meant to be used to save the old 286 and get away from the failing Maxter, but it just won't play ball in there for whatever reason, so it can live here for now. It probably won't stay here permanently as, well, I have another machine in mind for this, and I have something else in mind for this one. So there are other places these things can go that'll be more fitting. The drive is a Seagate, it has a capacity of around 40 megs. You know, I suppose we should listen to these drives spin up, shouldn't we? So, fast the Maxter. Now the Seagate. Yeah, them some stepper motors in there. So now the motherboard. 
we know who made this one. It's a chain tack. Uh, there's no doubt about this because they even branded their ISA slots, which is kind of awesome. I mean, they were gold plating their external connectors in the 2000s, so yeah. It's, I kind of like chain tack style, man. I originally built the machine with this TMC board, but it broke down and it has a rather nasty failure mode where it would post but would get stuck on the setup prompt. Weirdly, it wouldn't respond to the keyboard sequence to enter setup, but it would respond to other inputs like the three finger salute, and you could even generate keyboard errors by leaning on the spacebar or whatever to flood the keyboard buffer. And it still did this if the BIOS and KBC were changed. I tried to repair it, but to no avail, and when it goes into this state, it also turns CPUs, which is very, very odd. I can't find any stray voltages or anything, and it's not the only board I've had do this. It's a shame, though, because this board was pretty neat. It really, it uses a neat chipset. And that's what the chipset is called. It was from the 90s, it had onboard I.O., it had these stupid SIP RAM slots. It was a pretty nice piece of kit, but it didn't work, and I can't get it to work properly. Eventually it was at the point where I probably can fix it, but it's going to cost more than just buying a new board, hence the chain tech, which is from 1988, but it uses the same chipset as the TMC. In fact, it's using the TMC's BIOS, because the one it came with was a little bit dodgy. Someone had reflashed the chips in the past though, so I don't know if it was the original BIOS for this board, or just the first one they found that would work in it, but it wouldn't play ball with more than a meg of RAM or somewhere around there, and I wanted to install this 4 meg from the TMC board. This board actually supports more than that on this weird card that plugs into the header and I don't have it. I think later revisions of this board did switch to SIP RAM like the TMC. I do have to wonder however if the limit was put there on purpose and Chaintech would have just sent you a new set of BIOS chips if you ordered that expansion card. That would be a little bit dirty wouldn't it? Now, given my CNT386 has a similar interface stuck to it, I also have to wonder if CNT were leaning on board manufacturers to put stupid things like that in place. I mean, that board's made by Top Micro, and this is a chain tech, so they're a different manufacturer, and yet that thing looks really, really similar in how they've gone about it. And you do have to wonder. It's almost like all those Socket 7 boards that are missing voltage regulators are almost always on Intel chipsets. You don't see it so much on the CIS ones, and you start wondering if Intel was leaning on board manufacturers to just not implement those, so they'd be able to sell overdrive processors at a higher price later on. Of course, Intel would never do anything scummy like that. But nonetheless, whilst we do still have socketed memory chips on this motherboard, we no longer have a socketed chipset or much of anything else. As well, now it was becoming more economical to just replace the board if that went out, and as the chipset probably cost about as much as the board. I mean, let's be honest, the chipset pretty much is the board now. The integration is getting a lot better than it was on the older board. I need to clean the battery acid up, maybe we can do that at the end of the video. Haven't had time to do that yet, it's fine for now, I don't think it's going to just suddenly die on me. Obviously the board supports the 4 megs of dip RAM in these weird dual sockets. Still 36 chips, 2 banks of 18 just like before, just bigger. Despite all of the improvements, you can clearly tell this board is the direct descendant of those older boards. But now the platform is far more mature. This one is a little bit unusual because it uses an LCC chip for the CPU, a package that doesn't seem to be quite as common as PLCC. And I tell you what, I've never seen a PGA one in person, but apparently they exist. The heatsink has this little mounting mechanism that looks a tad flimsy, and beneath it is a ceramic chip. It's rated for 16 megahertz, which this board runs at, and only 16 megahertz. These chips are pretty cool to look at. They have no pins or external leads otherwise. In fact, you might say they resemble the later LGA chips, if only in principle. These are pressed into place by that heatsink, however, or an otherwise similar mechanism, rather than having a lever on the socket. No FPU is installed, and this board, I think, runs it at 12 megahertz, so none of mine would work in here, because the highest I've got is 10. I'm told it'd be fine, but they get quite toasty at their rated speed, so I'd rather not push my luck and break this thing. 16 megahertz systems seem a little less common than 12 megahertz ones, although the 386 seems to be even less common in this time period. And keep in mind that thing came out in 1985. It isn't unlikely that 12 megahertz 386DX systems were already available when my 6 megahertz 286 was brand new. These weren't hugely viable because you had to start selling kidneys to earn one. 
And people generally don't like it when you start shoving scalpels into them for some reason. The motherboards for them were also rather clunky. The 286 boards of the time were already barely more than modified 8088 boards in many cases. And now they were modifying those to run the 386. I mean, hell, a lot of them even took 287 FPUs for quite some time. Now, given we already established that most software was still being written to work on the 16-bit 8088, the 32-bit 386 had almost no incentive at this point. Not yet. And how it might have even been slower. It is interesting to think that this modification to existing boards lark did play a large part in the 286's use, though. Alongside the 286, Intel introduced another CPU, the 186, but it wasn't used anywhere near as much in PCs because it wasn't hugely compatible with the existing hardware and this meant motherboard designers would have to start over from the beginning. By contrast, the 286 could be bodged onto an existing board design with just a few modifications. In reality, the CPU was intended for multi-user systems and other applications. There did exist some multi-user and multitasking operating systems for it, but they don't appear to have been in widespread use, and, well, there's a whole rabbit hole here involving Microsoft and IBM and OS2 and DOS and Windows and stuff, but I'm not really going to go into that. I'm sure you can find information about it out there. I don't know that I'll ever cover it. It's not really my thing, but, yeah, it happened, and it's kind of this CPU's fault, I guess. So let's see how these things run anyway. This old 6 MHz machine is really slow. It takes its time to boot, it takes its time to load things, and you run out of road quickly once EGA graphics start coming into play. Some really old games and applications written for the 88 will obviously run too fast, which is why you have the d -tabo button. Uh, let's be honest, though, we're going to look at the upper limits, in which case, yeah, you're going to top out with games like Duke Nukem 1, and even then it's going to load very slowly can just about push keen vorticons, but there's going to be some noticeable stalling in places. Cosmos Cosmic Adventure is probably about as far as you'd want to go. It's playable, but it, it's going to be a tad sluggish. Still, this puny 6 MHz chip was evidently still able to do things in the early 1990s, albeit at the very bottom of the system requirements pile. The 486 already existed by then too, so yeah, this thing would have been getting a bit long in the tooth. The benchmarks obviously aren't going to be very pretty with this. We get 11 points in top bench and only pain in 3D bench, not even 15 points. Not much else will run on here, and I'm not going to bother anyway. There is, however, a park of the 286 that I think is often overlooked in this regard. It runs rings around the 8088. The Zenith Super Sport uses an 8 MHz 8088 CPU. It scores 6 points in top bench. Only 6 MHz, the 286 is almost twice as fast with its 11 points. It's quite a leap in a single CPU generation. Whilst we have an FPU, it's next to useless today because only things like CAD programs use it, and it might be slowing the system down slightly. And as for the 286 in general, it has a lot of dedicated hardware that the 8088 does not. Internally, the CPU has many more dedicated units for performing various functions rather than having to do everything general purpose in software kind of deal. It's far more powerful as a result. I might rag on the 286 has been largely useless to the hobbyist today, but really cannot take this achievement away from it. This thing was damn quick in its time. Especially when you consider the clocks scaled farther than 6 MHz, and they scale quite well up until a point. The 16 MHz machine obviously tramples the older one. It'll get 34 points in top bench and 21.6 points in 3D bench. It's actually held back a little bit by the Trident card, as we can use a more modern card like this Western Digital. Boosting the scores to 40 in top bench, but no change in 3D bench. I do think some of my weight states for the bus are probably a little bit heavier than they need to be. I could probably make things faster, but I don't want to. I don't care. It's fast enough. I mean, evidently, as I'm using the slower video card of these two, by 1988 standards, this thing is pretty mean, though. In some cases, it's almost four times faster than the 6 MHz system, and it's ludicrously faster than the aged 8088. That thing's never going to catch it. In fact, the 286 can sometimes outstrip a 386, which brings us to this. 
Intel learned their lesson from the 186 and to bring the cost of the 386 down, they released the 386SX, which then made the original 386 the DX. Yeah, they didn't have that designation originally, they were just the 386. It was still a 32-bit CPU, but now it uses a 16-bit data bus and a 24-bit address bus, just like the 286. It did so in such a way that it was fairly trivial for board designers to just stick them on a 286 board with minimal modifications. It so happens I own a 16 MHz one using that same Western Digital video chip in the form of the Toshiba T3200SX. This only scores 29 points in top bench. It's slower than the 286. But it does have some advantages. For one thing, it can run 32-bit code. Not necessarily very well, but it will run it. And for another, it has a more useful protected mode implementation. Technically, the 286 has fancy features like this, but they were brand new at the time, and almost nothing really ever used them. It's actually a shame, because one of the most impressive CPUs ever released in terms of its performance gains over its predecessor was probably never fully utilised. It's a very fast and very capable CPU for its time, but as many systems were still shipping with 8088 CPUs, or else all the systems were still commonly in use. Most software was been written for those 8088 machines, and the 286 features were just never really taken advantage of as, well, what's the point in writing a second version of the program? The 286 missed the boat on this because most of the software developers who kept things this way only changed when the 386 became more common and then targeted that instead. Interestingly, there were upgrades that allowed you to install a 386SX to a 286 motherboard, but these are quite rare and really only targeted a few OEM systems. I've never quite gotten mine to work, which is a shame because apparently has a small cache on board and is clock doubling. I'd only want to test it, it's not like I'd want to use it permanently. I mean, I built a 286 to have a 286, so I don't install it again in short order. If this 16 MHz 286 is good enough anyway, in, in fact you can just barely push into things that use VGA graphics on this one. Even shitty things like Save Our Pizzas will work on here, and well, let's be honest, once you start going into games that tried to look 3D, things start wanting 32-bit processors pretty quickly anyway, I mean... There's not too much of a gap here, and my 386DX is going to fill that gap, or 486, or whatever else. It's, I'm not worried. From a hobbyist perspective today, there isn't much reason to earn a 286, unless you really, really want to earn a 286, which, obviously, I would totally understand. If you just want to run some stuff in this performance range, though, and skip all of the hassle that comes with them, then a 386SX is probably a much more sensible option. In fact, they're a little bit overlooked much of the time, as nobody really seems to want those that much, and they can still be had a bit cheaper than the other platforms for now, if you wait around look around. This is going to change, because prices prices obviously go up all the time. You would effectively have a slightly slow 286 that can run a little bit of 32-bit code, and what little you'd want to at those low speeds, and it can also run operating systems like Windows 3.1 much more competently. You're not just going to constantly run out of memory and have to not use things, features be missing because you're on a 16-bit CPU. That better protected mode implementation definitely helps out there. The 386SX can also use more common memory types. It doesn't throw a fit about expansion cards and hard drives interfaces anywhere now as often as the 286. They're generally not pretty machines because they were made to be cheap, but they'll get the job done and they will do the job well enough, especially if you plan to venture beyond 12 MHz, as the 286 platform seems not to make such large gains anymore once you go beyond that. Well, if you don't believe me, here's my spa board. It's a 12 MHz one. It's not that far behind the 16 MHz system with 36 points in top bench, and it's actually faster in 3D bench with 36.5 points. I suspect this board is running the ISA bus out of spec. They keep losing touch with the hard driver when it's running things at full speed. Still, as you can see, the, we're not really gaining much by going beyond this. We were using the Paradise card in these tests. It is worth noting that when I mentioned NMOS chips, I did have a purpose in doing so, as CMOS chips were made later, like this 12 MHz one, usually designated by having a C after the 80 or somewhere else. It's going to say something like 80C286. These use less power and they run a lot colder. They were normally reserved for laptops and they would have cost more than the NMOS version at the time, but 
operationally they're indistinguishable and nowadays you can get them for about the same as the NMOS version it may be worth throwing one of these in if you've got a 286 and are having issues with it getting too hot it'll certainly help out it might even last a bit longer well I'd really have to see a decent sample size on that because CMOS has a lower tolerance to high temperatures than NMOS does I think so yeah, I wonder why that line gets crossed. You know, if there's one lesson I've learned over time, and I really should have learned by now, is that buying things that are shiny is usually the worst solution. I mean, look at this churn tech board, it's full of battery acid, it works fine. That SunTech one looks like it just left the factory, it doesn't work right. I can't find any documentation for the jumpers, I think the weight states are wrong, but yeah, good luck figuring out how to change those. It's uh, a bit strange. It always works out that way. Every time I buy busted shit, it works. And every time I buy shiny, it works great, looks new stuff. It doesn't. So, you know, go figure. That's uh, that's something to keep in mind, because busted looking shit usually costs less as well. <laughs> Especially if it is actually busted. But, like I say, I get expected, oh, this will be fun to repair. And then it just starts right up. This is what I wanted to repair it. It works. And I'll just break it now, just so I can fix it. <laughs> Nonetheless, as much as I do bash on it and make fun of it, I can see the appeal of the 286. Even if its capabilities are a bit limited and at times the older ones have trouble with certain hardware. The 386 is certainly a better platform if you can get hold of one, especially if it's a 3860X. But hey, you know, I like this thing. It's I'm having fun with it and I suppose that's all that matters. It's a, a hobby that I do for fun, so... If I'm having fun, then I guess it's it's okay, right? It's uh, doing it the right way. Fuck knows. Anyway, uh, back to that dude on the camera. Well, that's about as far as uh, I think we need to go on this. I'm probably going to show the uh, cleaning out of the faster 286 while this is going on. It saves time, doesn't it? We can do two things at once. So, yeah, uh, that's that. 286 got a lot faster over time you know it's, it's quite an impressive uh i mean to start with it's impressive the leap it took over the the 8088 and the leap it then took over itself is really pretty good i, I don't really hear people mention that much but then i suppose i'm not really into to pre-486 stuff that much it's fun to get out every once in a while but i certainly don't use these as much because you just can't can't do as much on them and let's be honest most of the stuff it can do my 486 or my Pentium is probably going to do better but that doesn't discredit the, the machine at all and like I say certainly the capabilities of the CPU the 286 is a really impressive processor when you actually look at it uh, for, for what it did um, real shame it, it doesn't seem to have been taken advantage of as much as it could there, there will be things out there that did but uh, whether they're worth digging up and running now I, I couldn't tell you like what actual use they'd be and how much fun they would be to mess with. I mean, it's not always whether it's useful. If it's fun, then it, it's useful because it's fun, right? It's a hobby. That's what, what the point is. But, yeah, I don't know how fun that stuff would be to, to mess with. It's, uh, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate, you know, they, they just kind of kept supporting the old 8088 and then went straight to the 386, you know, late 80s, start the 90s, around there somewhere. It, just the way it landed I suppose it's the 386 is definitely when I, th I feel the PC matured uh, the, the 8088 was a, a very immature sort of didn't really do a whole lot yet clunky kind of solution the 286 was was kind of the teenage years when it started being able to do a few things that it couldn't before you know Har started growing out of, out of places and that but it didn't really know how to do those things properly yet it, it was just figuring itself out it's it's a, an oddball platform it, it, it always seems to come with hassle every time i go and it so like i said you know it's it's up to you if you if you want this or if you want to dodge it kind of thing if you you're into this i guess you know yeah, I don't mind the hassle, it's it's alright, but some people don't like it, and they, in that case, you know, 386SX, probably a better solution. If you like messing about and trying to figure out why the hell things don't work, and spending way more hours than you should, then there's no harm in them, but, yeah, it's, 
not really the biggest software library available for it. That's really, really all that great. I mean, uh, you know, I can't think of anything that's exclusive to the 286 that you just couldn't do on another platform. It's uh, kind of a shame. The, the slower one, it's a shame we're probably going to lose it. I, I am going to try and fix it, you know, but hard drives, man, they cost a lot of money and there's, you know, the limits on it booting, I'd have to replace the floppy drive, they cost a lot of money. Floppy disks, not cheap if I can find them and they don't really work very well, you know, so they probably just break anyway. It costs way more than the machine's worth. I've had my money out of it for what it cost to build, so this would cost more than it cost to build. I'm not really sure I want to put it in. I don't use it that much. People always tell me to use XT IDE, but it doesn't work. And I want to be clear, I'm not trying to bash on the person who made XT IDE because, I mean, the name gives it away. As far as I know, it was basically just made to work on, like, IBM XTs or something. I don't own such a machine, but I would imagine it probably works flawlessly if you stick it on an EEPROM and shove it in a, an IBM XT. The, the bias for it probably comes right, it detects a drive and away you go, and that's really good. So I guess it, if it is doing that, it's doing what it's set out to do, it's doing what it claims to, and I, I can't knock it if that's, that's what it was written for, but it does not work on generic motherboards. I've, Never really gotten it to work. The farthest I've got is actually on the Fast 286. I was experimenting with it. I stuck it on a ROM chip, put that ROM chip at C800, which doesn't get in the way of the VGA bias, that's tiny. And weird thing happens when you do that. The system bias gets copied to C800, and I don't know whether it's the system bias or XTIDE doing that, uh, Adaptex SCSI cards do something similar, where the Adaptex bias ends up getting copied over the system bias somehow. I, I don't know, but when I perk around in debug, that's what I get out. The Adaptex one's worse, because it sometimes enables write pins and stuff. It's very obscure, but my K5 does that. And yeah, it actually wipes the bias out if you're, you're not aware of it already. This is a, isn't a flash like ROM. I, you know, I, I don't... It's not doing that, it's like memories getting remapped somehow. I, I really don't know what's going on. It's just a little bit beyond my understanding. So, obviously, then I, I try other addresses and I stick XTID at C triple O. Obviously, now it's in the way of the VGA card, the machine beeps angrily. So, I don't know if it works. I don't think it does because I didn't get any drive activity. So. Yeah, then what I did was, instead of putting zeros at the end of the ROM, I put them at the beginning and I offset it, so having it at C treble O would mean the XTIDE bias starts at C800 now. It comes up, it'll appear on the screen, but it won't detect anything, so I don't know. And like I say, this system I can actually use IDE drives without it, so I don't need it, but I was messing with it to see if I can get it to work. That's the farthest I've ever got. It doesn't work in anything else I've ever put it in, so don't waste your time suggesting it. It doesn't work, you know. I wish it did. It would be so nice if it did that it would make things so much easier, but it's the same with fucking floppy emulators. Those things are utterly useless. I, I really... They're pretty crap. I can see some applications where they'd be useful, but they're not really good for, for hobbyists, you know. They're, their capabilities are way too limited, like what, the, the HXC ones are basically useless for anything but 1.4 meg MS DOS floppies, which, yeah, they seem to kill USB sticks, and can't boot from 720 on them, or, like, they don't emulate 360k or anything, so what fucking good are they? Uh, HXC ones are expensive and about as useless, so... Those things are fucking stupid, which is a shame, because it make working on things a lot easier if I could just have all my floppies on a USB stick. Uh, uh, that's the way it is. I'll, like I say, I'll try and save that machine. I got some ideas. Uh, I, I have a maximum price I'm willing to put into it, which is probably more than I should, but it's still, still not really even as much as people want for working hard drives now. And, I don't know. Well, I'll come up with something or just let it go and just use this faster machine. At least this fast one's good. That's really about all I've got. If I sound ill and shit, it's uh, hair fever's really bad, so 
you know, stack in a fair amount of concentration to not just start like spewing like burgers and slime all over the fucking camera, which I, I'm sure you would just love me to do. So I, I guess I can't stand here too long. And this isn't the video I wanted to do, like I so said, I had to do it now because Slow 286 is probably about to give out and I wanted to compare the two machines. So we just had to put this together. Everything else is delays as always this year, just shit in the way, real life shit. Not being able to get hold of things is just one thing or a fucking another. I mean, it's the first time I've been able to walk in here in about six months because, you know, you need a car to use city waste disposal facilities apparently. Apparently now I don't, so find out and get rid of the trash because eventually it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> My fucking kitchen stank. I mean, there's only so much you can throw over the fucking fence and hope uh, nobody notices. You can't just sling like a month worth of garbage over there. And, somebody's going to see it, you know. <laughs> and plus you have to go through it to make sure there's no bills in there so they don't fucking figure out what are you supposed to do? I don't have a fucking car. I want a bike. <laughs> Idiots. Anyway, uh, yeah. I don't want a kid on shit in the background, but it's slow. So I don't know what'll be next. Uh, I'd hate to say, because it'll probably just go wrong and it, it won't work out as it should again, you know. <laughs> that seems to be the way this year. Who fucking knows? But I'm sure we'll get that. I don't work to a schedule. I don't aim to, because then it will turn out awful. And so, yeah. Yeah, so that's it. Until next time, I'm High Treason. And until next time, remember, don't waste the hard drive. Use DOS 5. It's, it's getting worse. Who thought this was a good idea? <laughs>